This is The Dreadful Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, our 501st episode. We've watched Penny Dreadful, City of Angels, Season 1, and here's our wrap-up. There will come a time when the world is ready for me. When nation will battle nation. When race will devour race. When brother will kill brother. Until not a soul is left. Are you ready? Tiago Vega. Welcome back, fellow Penny Faithful. This is TV Podcast Industries, where we're talking about the Penny Dreadful City of Angels first season. Hopefully, first of a couple of seasons. And this is our wrap-up episode. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, Penny Faithful. I am one of your other hosts, John. I am one of your other hosts, Chris. And joining us for this discussion, we have one of our other fellow Penny Faithful, Ronaldo Gizmundo. Welcome back, mate. Hello, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be back. Thank you for having me. This is the first time I think that the full compliment is is all here. Uh, I've, mm-hmm. I've had the great fortune of speaking to each and every one of you on my show. I've been uh, chatting with John and and Derek yourself on uh, the Penny Dreadful recap of you know the older seasons. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's great to see Chris here as well. Uh, I'm, I'm pumped. Great to have you here. Yeah, we couldn't really do the wrap up of City of Angels if we didn't have Ray back on for this episode because he did help us out on those recaps of the first three seasons of uh, of Penny Dreadful. And having all four of us here for this episode feels right, really, directly after our 500th episode, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, it's great to have you here, Ray, for sure. And yeah, great to have you as well, Chris. Um, no, to no. have you here is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we you just had me for every other episode. But yes, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd like to be wanted. <laughs> if you don't know Ray, if you didn't listen to our previous podcast and didn't uh, catch him on there, Ray is the host of Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. The, uh, we made him change the name from a Moon Knight podcast <laughs> to the Moon Knight podcast on our Penny Dreadful podcast, didn't we? Um, so yeah, Ray, you're right now in the middle of probably the biggest Marvel event for Moon Knight that's out there, uh, which is Age of Khonshu, where Moon Knight is up against the Avengers. How's that been going for you? Yeah, good. If I can just say as well, just with the, the Moon Knight podcast, which you guys got, got us on to, mm-hmm. it's really catching on, actually. Um, uh, <laughs> I think um, there have been a few questions, you know, is it A or is it the? And I've heard to always say, look, it's the. Excellent. Because we are the Moon Knight podcast. So, yeah, thanks for that. That's um, It's really cool. You have to be the definitive article, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, but yeah, the Age of Conchu Part Two, where it, it's up to uh, Part Two, obviously in issue thirty-four of the Avengers, mm-hmm. uh, it's hitting the ground running. It's so fast-paced. Jason Aaron, Javier Garon uh, on on art, beautiful mm-hmm. art. Uh, so we're you know we're absorbed in it. We're loving it. Some loonies, it may not be their favorite iteration of Moon Knight, mm-hmm. but uh, that's what kind of makes this thing fun. You can discuss why and why not, and uh, exactly. as long as things are are kept on the level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I've really liked about it is that they actually put in a few different versions of the character of Moon Knight, the way he's been portrayed over the years as well. So it's kind of something for everybody. So if you don't like the main version that you see of Moon Knight in the book, it's kind of like, well, turn to the next page and you'll see another version of him or another portrayal of the character as well. So it's kind of it's it's interesting, I'm sure, for you guys to be able to discuss those different versions of him over the course of, what's it, 40 years, 50 years, 45 years, something like that he's been around. So lots of different versions since the 70s, I suppose. So um, so it's kind of, kind of cool that they're bringing them all into this big story. And Jason Aaron is such a good writer. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Jason Aaron is a good egg, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, he, he's great. He, he comes up with really good ideas. Um, a lot of them, for me, you kind of think, hmm, that was in the back of my head. Like, it, it, everything that he does seems to make sense. It's kind of like, oh, mm-hmm. this is great. Like, we're getting almost, almost fan service. I don't want to say that because I don't want to 
take it down to just mere fan service. But he yeah. really does tap into what I guess a lot of fans um, have always speculated or wanted in Moon Knight, uh, and he mm-hmm. brings it out. So, yeah, without any spoilers, but there are a, a few big things that happen in issues 33 and 34. So it's um, and we've got another four more issues, so it's a six-parter, I know. Uh, so mm-hmm. we'll see where he takes it, but it's uh, it's it's up fifth gear like already. It's uh, I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. If you want to hear Ray's podcast, Ray, do you want to tell them where you can find it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, look, I've patented the Ray Ramble, so you'll hear me rambling on the show. Uh, you can find me on on Twitter <laughs> at the handle at itk moon knight. Also, as well, to make things very easy, uh, on Facebook, facebook.com slash ITK Moon Knight, and a Facebook group as well, uh, facebook.com slash group slash IT, ITK Moon Knight. And look, as well, I was just reminded, Derek, um, you know, for the, for the younger uh, generation, Instagram, I, I believe, is, is more popular these days, I think. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we're on mm-hmm. there too, ITK Moon Knight. Just check <laughs> us out. <laughs> excellent, excellent. You're down with the kids. I get it. Exactly. Someday we'll get onto TikTok somehow. I still don't know how that works. Different about oh my stuff. god, I want to see you on TikTok <laughs> anyway. so badly. Just do. I know. I, 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 I do too. Okay. <laughs> is that just a social media it platform is, for clocks? Is. I just want to I don't see know. you do like, t- Here's t- a grandfather t- clock. Dance. Um, oh my god, <laughs> listeners! If you want to see derek and john dancing on tiktok let us know because they will you know they if we put enough pressure on them we can get this to happen come on people no it's not about the pressure chris it's about the amount of drink i've had and then okay. i will be dancing or as at my brother's uh, wedding uh, where i was affectionately called the jombie uh, rather than a zombie, because I was actually dancing uh, fast asleep uh, by the sounds of it. I was so inebriated wow. um, that I was kind of just swaying to the music as I slept standing up. So there's a vampire there you for go. you straight So off. if you too love, want to it. see a swaying zombie asleep while <laughs> on social media and to, to some... Well, we'll call it that Penny Dreadful song that you heard at the beginning. Just let us know by going over to Twitter at TV Pod Industries and or just go to Facebook.com slash group slash TV Podcast Industries and let us know. We'll set up a poll, vote, do whatever you want. Just get these boys on TikTok. Anyway. I think that might have worked for uh, for the Watchmen, maybe. TikTok might have done it. Yeah, that that, well, that could have been our entry point for yeah. sure. I think we've missed our chance. Thank God <laughs> they're not doing a well... season two. Well, let's get into our discussion about Penny Dreadful. Um, I know that uh, Penny Dreadful was released in the UK quite recently uh, Sky, on Sky Atlantic. They decided to uh, hold off on releasing the episodes weekly release the whole thing for everybody to download and watch and then release weekly as well. So I think right now, as we're recording this recap episode, uh, they're all available to watch for everybody, uh, but they're still going out on Wednesday nights. They're about halfway through the season on their weekly uh, release. So this is a good point to jump in and listen to a recap of the entire season of the show. You may be listening to this just before season two comes out if there is a season two. Uh, so it may be just down the line. We will recap the, the whole season. We'll discuss uh, most of the major moments and the major storylines of the season and discuss what our thoughts overall were on the show. Um, before we go into that season, just a general idea of what, what you guys thought. Ray, I know you've, you've sent in a little bit of feedback over the course of the season. We know you've been generally enjoying the show, but what was your overall feeling when you finished the season? What did you think of the show overall? Yeah, I was, I was really happy with it. Um, I, I came into it with a little bit of trepidation only because um, I hold the previous seasons in such high regard and, mm-hmm. uh, and knowing of the format of, of city of angels being a, a departure from that of the Victorian age and such. Uh, so I was a little bit hesitant, but uh, I'd say after about maybe one or maybe two episodes, uh, it, it, I got it got me hooked. I mm. mean, the performances from the actors were great. Nathan Lane, in particular, was my my standout. I mean, but they were all really good. Uh, but also the uh, the interweaving of all the plots mm-hmm. as well. Uh, so no, I, I liked it. Um, and and I think by the end of it, it was very much a standalone kind of series. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, really, it, it didn't really need even Penny Dreadful in it. I, I felt. Yeah. I felt. Yeah. So. I yeah. think that's one of the things that, that stood out to me over the course of the season. I, I started to notice that the main graphic for the show was City of Angels in massive letters and then a tiny little Penny Dreadful underneath it. But <laughs> just the show is named Penny Dreadful City of Angels. So it looks like it's got much, a bit much bigger ta- tie to the original series, but actually 
when you look at the graphics for the show, it is City of Angels with just that little tag showing it's a John Logan supernatural production, let's say. So uh, it's one of the things that I just thought was quite interesting. Um, John, what did you think overall of this first season? I'm kind of with uh, Ray here, to be honest. Um, like, I, I really loved the show in the end, and I thought it gave a, a, just... John Logan's such a good writer. It, it was really well written. Um, it was really intriguing. Like I loved the history aspects of it around sort of that whole, um, the, the Nazi infiltration into America, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of almost, um, the precursor to man in a high castle kind of vibe to it. Uh, th yeah. this idea of espionage and, and competing interests. Um, uh, so I loved that. And the same with like Brian Koenig and the rocket technology, the, the, those kind of elements to me, I found really, uh, really interesting, but, uh, and the performances were great. I mean, uh, they just, they were just so good. And of course, I think if you're given sort of that kind of script, um, it, it probably is such a great thing as a, as an actor, mm -hmm. uh, to, to get your teeth into. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think similarly, I think just probably the pressure on the series because it had the Penny Dreadful moniker, um, mm -hmm. it, it is, was the, the hurdle to overcome because it was never going to be the same as, um, sort of those, those twisted, dark, uh, literary, uh, giants like Dracula and Frankenstein. Um, you know, th this, this had no reference like that, that yeah. people who were fans of those books, of those characters, um, so it, it's totally fresh. And I, I think it does is a, a great kind of, um, it's just novel and new. And I, that's why I liked about it. You know, I mean, even season three of the original gets, um, a bit of, uh, splashback in that sense, you know, uh, so this was always good, probably going to get that, but yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I think again, a bit like with Ray, I would have just liked to have seen some more supernatural elements here mm -hmm. in that i think um particularly there's there was the santa muerta thing and magda obviously but i i think rio's references to aztecs and the blood and mm -hmm. that kind of the laws the law around aztecs and and maybe even to an extent a bit um native american Indus, I, I, indians that kind of the law surrounding mm -hmm. those cultures and, and the superstitions around them i think could have really, really worked here, mm. um, much more than was utilized by John Logan. But, you know, c'est la vie, um, it, it, it didn't happen. So, uh, yeah, but I really, really, um, enjoyed th this series. Excellent. Excellent. Chris, overall thoughts? Um, I become more trepid. Uh, we're recording this a bit out from our, um, uh, since we kind of wrapped up on it. And so when I was kind of trying to, parse my feelings on it i become more tepid on it and a bit more mm -hmm. I'm a bit more trepidatious going into season two nothing mm. to say it like it it while we were in it it was great and there are some standout performances and standout episodes um it's just it's got that season one problem especially with john logan and we've discussed it um kind of at length it's um I should say ad nauseum at this point. Uh, it's <laughs> don't say ad nauseum, Chris. Oh, but why? <laughs> I do. I said I discussed this problem ad nauseum, not this problem with this show ad nauseum. I discussed okay, the problem okay. ad nauseum, mm. where um, nobody nobody's nauseous at your voice. Oh Chris, my god, so. I am. Uh, <laughs> essentially, it's the it's the the setups are there for so much that just was not mm. answered. Um. So I. In the, the perfect example is craft. How craft mm -hmm. will play into the greater story. We, uh, throughout this season, we were, we were all to, at one point or another, mostly me, I know I was more vocal about it. Come on, what's the deal with craft? How is this going to play into the greater? What? Yeah. And it was about what? Episode eight? Uh, episode eight was the introduction to craft's background. Um, episode nine was, kind of him getting pushed a bit further and then the 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 final scene with him in episode 10 with the the hile um and the salute was just okay still don't fully know how that will play into a greater storyline it seems to be that the they were trying unfortunately they i 
either this was maybe a more than a 10 episode original order. Uh, John Logan pitched two or three seasons first. Um, Definitely. And it's just, I'm going to set all these seeds up. So I just felt it didn't, it, it, it cannot be con- uh, considered a self-contained season. Like mm-hmm. you will, will need season two to answer some of the questions that were raised or to make aspects of season one make more sense. Um, mm-hmm. so overall, I enjoyed it. Overall, it has some fantastic elements, it has some great performances. Uh, again, as Ronaldo said, uh, like Nathan Lane is a standout. Um, it's just, I just feel at this point, like you said, I, even what you said, it's missing supernatural. I think that the promise at the end of see, of uh, at the last episode with Magda and Tiago, like mm-hmm. that could be even more supernatural in the next season. It's just yeah, we don't absolutely. Know. Um, so that's absolutely it. one of the things I, I really liked uh, after the season. One of the things I really caught was a comment from John Logan saying this idea that he had of keeping your two main characters, Tiago and Magda apart for 10 entire episodes of a season. He just loves the concept of having those two people that you're following in completely different ways throughout the season. And then never meeting even once. And even in that last scene, it's her whispering on the wind and her, and him not hearing her. So they still haven't shared a scene together from, uh, from the first episode to the last, which is a really interesting thing in a show. It's sort of something that they've never really done on anything else I, I can think of uh, having two completely different, uh, two, two main characters on completely different story paths. But the question is just because you can do it. Should you do it? That is the question. Uh, Just because I can jump off a bridge, should I jump off the bridge? That is a (laughs) good question. It's not that big a thing, I suppose, as, as jumping off a bridge, Chris, I don't think. But it is an interesting idea. And I think for me, for my idea for the first season, what I really did enjoy was uh, the concept of using the past to interpret things that were happening in the real world today. It's something that uh, that Logan has spoken about, that that's why he wanted to write it. Instead of just shouting into the void, he wanted to talk about what was really going on in the world today and what was happening with, uh, with American politics and with uh, immigration in America and with uh, how people are being treated that are, that are non-white and outside of the main uh, section section of society or the people that think they have the power so i think he really accomplished that goal throughout the season i think he had some amazing moments in this season that as we watched them things were going on in the real world that he couldn't possibly have imagined were happening on those particular weeks that we were watching the episode sometimes it was i think we had a couple of warnings before the episode aired because we were going uh this is something that that can be uh can, can be seen in the real world right now and everybody uh, might find this quite a difficult watch, I suppose. Um, so I think overall what he accomplished with that was excellent. Um, I do think, and I know we keep mentioning that there's going to be a season two of this, and I know there's a lot of people that think there's not going to be a season two. Uh, one of the things that I just want to point out is that this show moved to LA because it got a massive grant from LA to make the show there. It got $20 million uh, at least to make the episodes of the season. That's a massive boost to it. So it's quite likely that they brought Logan on board and said, Here's this massive investment. Make your show. And he said, I'll do it if I get two seasons. Um, so because they all had all that payback and, you know, the rights were sold internationally and all that kind of stuff, I do think that the monetary side of this is kind of taken care of regardless of the actual viewership live weekly, uh, which wasn't great on uh, Showtime itself, but the channel itself doesn't have massive ratings. It's a, a very much a premium channel. So, uh, and so in terms of whether it will get a second season, I do think it will if they have any belief in, in what he's trying to deliver. And I think that does change how a story is done you know it's kind of like making the first episode of a movie series uh, if you're making that going well i have a second episode coming out in the next couple of months couple of months or a couple of years then i'll change the story whereas he don't think he was ever intending this to be a standalone season the classic example recently is watchman mm-hmm. um in that sense yeah. where where it's this is a standalone one season only mm-hmm. okay uh, hbo can go off and do a season two but it's not going to be uh, damon lindelof uh, that will will do it, um, and I think you know classically it's the Wire where the creators of the Wire came and said we have five five seasons yeah. across five different areas of Baltimore uh, around drugs, and um, we will tap into each of that. But once it's done, it's done. And I think um, you know I think that's the constant battle in TV between TV studios and uh, and dare I say even film studios this battle of. Uh, what the creator 
is looking to do and then how that evolves if it becomes popular or not how then uh, that gets modified yeah. um because they do it for 25 seasons likes for example supernatural which yeah. i happen to like um it would have been kind of interesting if the winchester boys had come down from uh seattle uh -huh. uh, and and joined the fight um <laughs> against uh, magda but uh you know it, i think that's the constant battle mm -hmm. of of tv and and movies to be honest um and that's the that's the kind of creative tension there mm -hmm. um i think I, I, but, but i i also i was just going to say i also think that I think this season of Penny Dreadful City of Angels is very similar to season one of Penny Dreadful mm -hmm. um, because that really didn't give you the overall element. It it it, it answered the story about Mina Harker yeah. uh, and uh, it, it answered that story. But ultimately, after the three seasons, you realize it was this battle of... Uh, of uh, Vanessa with um, Dracula and with with the devil, yeah. and and here similarly, um, the answer is really into the Hazlitt murders. Mm. Uh, everything else is still up in the air a bit, yeah. and and I, so I, I see a bit of a commonality. I'm not saying it's, it's obviously not exactly the same, yeah. um, but for sure, um, the, there is that commonality. Yeah. Um, and I think the main difference is that there's a little, maybe a little bit more artistic license with going back into the Victorian period uh, and using literary characters as that sort of catalyst mm. compared to trying to get a more realistic tone around things like building a motorway and the the sort of the race and culture wars mm -hmm. that were were happening in the 30s. It's, it's kind of a different yeah. slant. So... Um, but yeah, it's... I, I totally agree with you that there's the connection between Penny Dreadful season one and, and this season. I can definitely see what you mean. I think maybe the Hazlitt murder element of it, which is the central storyline from the first episode to the last, I think it wasn't enough of a reveal, I suppose, because it was just dropped in a line where we found out who we knew mur murdered the Hazlitts pretty much from the third episode. We kind of knew that it was going to be uh, Molly's mother that, that was the murderer, but it's dropped in a line in the last episode. So it was a through line story, but it didn't end off in like the massive battle that we saw in the finale of, no. of season one of, of Penny Dreadful, I suppose. So maybe that was a little bit unsat unsatisfactory as the central storyline yeah. that it was all pinned on. So that's kind of it for the overall thoughts on the first season of the show. I know we're in our recap episode now, so we're going to spoil everything about the season overall. John's going to give us a bit of a summary uh, for what's happened in the season. Guys, if you want to jump in at any point and, and talk about any, any individual moments that, that are going out. But this is kind of the boiling down of all of the central storyline of season one of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. John, do you want to give us the summary for the show? Sure. The Lady of the Holy Death, Santa Muerta, and her demon sister, Magda, discuss the fate of mankind. Magda believes that all mankind needs to be the monster he truly is, is being told he can, and wants to prove it to Santa Muerta. Magda kills a group of Mexican farm workers, including Jose Vega. As Jose dies in her arms, Santa Muerta protects his son, Tiago, leaving him scarred for life. Now, in 1938, on his first day as the only Mexican-American detective in the LAPD, Tiago Vega is confronted by the grisly murder of the Hazlitts, a rich white family from Beverly Hills. Working with his Jewish partner, Louis Michener, their investigation leads them to the Joyful Voices Ministry, where Tiago falls in love with his prime suspect in the case, Sister Molly Finister. But Molly learns that her own mother, Miss Adelaide, had the Hazlitt family murdered to protect their church's wealth and influence. Adelaide used traditional Mexican iconography to hide the motive for the Hazlitt's death. Reeling from the revelation, Sister Molly takes her own life and is welcomed into the arms of Santa Muerta. So that's kind of what we were talking about beforehand. The kind of revelation, I suppose, that Miss Adelaide is the one that had the Hazlitt family killed. And this idea that she used the Mexican iconography to hide the motive isn't really explored throughout the season. You know, it's something that causes Diego to get the blame effectively for the death. And and it, we know that it's from the Mexican community or we're told throughout the season that they're the ones who are being investigated for the murder. But did you guys think that this was something that wasn't really pulled out throughout the season? I don't think she even mentions it in that last episode. <laughs> 
I can only speak for myself, but when the premise of the Hazlitt murders came about, uh, for me, it seemed like, okay, this is, this will be one of the main focal points. It will be a running thread throughout the whole season. Uh, and as mm-hmm. you alluded to, Derek, I just, I, th- I felt it, it took a back seat. And there was, as you say, there, there could have been so much more that was, um, explored in it. Uh, mm-hmm. for me, the pacing felt a bit off, but I know, I guess I know what John Logan was trying to do. It was only a, a, a tool, um, and not the main kind of focal point because realistically the whole season was, um, kind of the momentum was brought forth by all the interactions between those main characters. And the Hazlitt case, really, I mean, it has its place in there, but it's not the main the main thrust. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I just found it was a little off for me because, uh, yeah, it, it kind of just disappeared. And it was, as you, as you say, it was kind of just mentioned in passing and, and that was it. And, and even towards the end of the yeah. season, it was kind of glossed over really quickly. It's like, well... Wow, you know, everyone was talking about the Hazlitt case. It was, um, Michener and Tiago were, or Tiago were, were meant to find the killers or at least get someone to, to, um, step in as, as the, um, Mm -hmm. the murderer for it. Uh, but it kind of got lost in the whole, the whole mesh of things. Yeah, I, th- I definitely think it got it got lost, but I, I think where it played the the bigger part, and I think as you say, it, it's more oblique, really. It's kind of the draw in, and then it's really, I mean, there are a few moments early on where they're following the leads, like going to to the uh, to Molly's kind of beachside house and so on. Mm-hmm. But I think the big point where it played in is ultimately uh, where it plays into Michener. Uh, effectively giving Diego that, that choice, um, and to pin, uh, the, the, their murders on him as well as with Officer Riley. Uh, and it, and it also, I think, spoke to just the general, um, dare I say, it, th- this idea of racial bias within the police where you had Captain Vanderhoff constantly saying, I don't actually really want you to investigate this murder. I just need effectively a patsy, yeah. which ultimately is what Michener delivers to him, uh, in order to, uh, yeah. save Matteo, um, from, uh, being implicated mm-hmm. for the death of Riley. So it, it kind of worked in, in a way to that kind of thing. And, but ultimately, um, the idea of, as you say, I think with, with, uh, Miss Adelaide, I think that was possibly where it really kind of just got kind of, uh, well, was allowed to slide, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, but on the point of Miss Adelaide, I think for me as well, I like I thought that scene with Sister Molly uh, taking her own life mm-hmm. actually was just quite incredible. Really um, and and I think the, oh, yeah. the great thing I like about what John Logan does, and I think the actors here, is that you know someone like. Miss Adelaide, I mean, she was obnoxious. She was horrible all the way through. Like, you just really, you could see why Sister Molly wants to kind of run away to, to Mexico with, with Tiago. Yeah. Um, and just get out of there, like the pressure. Just in that moment where she sees her daughter sort of lying or face down in the water with the blood around her. And you see just the, the acting chops of Amy Madigan. Mm-hmm. Um, I just thought that I thought she was amazing. Um, and I, I really liked her. Um, it, it, that, you know, you felt sorry for her in that moment, even though she'd been despicable pretty much all the way through. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. kind of what I, I love the nuance that comes in actual characterization mm-hmm. and people's portrayal. You know, I mean, unfortunately, there is this, we, you know, we kind of live in this world where everything has to be black or white. Yeah. Um, and yet everyone lives their life in just pure, like gray. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that by being like mm. boring sods. All I right. just mean like, you know, obviously right. that. Everyone's very complex, and I yeah. love that John Logan kind of can capture that yeah. in in the characterization. I think that's really good. Um, I think the one drawback in this season, and that it, that we've kind of mentioned a few times, is that there's so many characters in here, yeah. all grey, that a lot of the nuances can be hidden. Um, while I think the Hazla case was the main jump off point at the beginning of the season, and the main end to one of the major characters is caused by the Hazla case in the last episode of the season, and an end to another character is caused by it as well. I do think that it was hidden in the background with so much other stuff going on. And I think there's a few things that they could have explored, like why 
there was a ritualistic killing here that that really didn't seem to be uh, mm. pulled out enough uh, in the show. Anything on this, Chris, before we continue on with the summary? Yeah, just really quickly. It was too mm-hmm. late. Essentially, it was just if they had of this had this uh, reveal at episode mm. five, um, then then it could have been explored a yeah. bit further. But it it almost seemed like they they had we had all this other great story and they were wrapping things up. And went oh shit, we forgot to tell them. <laughs> Holy god! Okay, work quickly. You put it in this line. Okay, there you go. That neatly tied a bow right, bow right. around it. Um, but if you had to put this in season fi- in episode five, then you can still have all the other story mm-hmm. beats. But then you could have explored that one piece, which is essentially why. Uh, Miss Adelaide decided it needed to be the kind of Santa Muerte kind of ritualistic, which is pretty much because she yeah. was racist and she wanted to pin it on the uh, Mexicans. And that then allows her to work with the mm-hmm. Nazis to get her end result, which is exactly where we end up yeah. anyway at the end yeah, of the season. Exactly. Just, um, so I just think it was just exactly. time just a little bit further. Um, if it had been earlier, it yeah, would have been absolutely. great. Anyway, moving on swiftly. Yeah. However, before Tiago's arrival at the LAPD as a detective, Louis Michener had been fighting the creeping influence of the Nazis on Los Angeles with his friends Dottie, Sam, Anton, and the Jewish mafia boss, Benny Berman. When Sam and Anton are murdered by the Nazis, the Jewish friends try to save a young scientist, Brian Koenig. Koenig has worked out the secret to rocket-propelled flight, which could give the Nazis' weapon range all the way to the USA. When Michener learns that Brian Koenig is fascinated by the science of what he is creating and has no thought of the possible impacts, the detective chooses death for the young scientist. Another kind of interesting storyline, I suppose, for the season. Yeah, I thought it was interesting um, just in the fact that, uh, and John Logan does this for the, all, all, all the seasons of Penny Dreadful as well. Uh, he kind of colors the stories with historical, uh, references, like our reality. And I really mm-hmm. like that because, uh, he kind of, he brings it a little closer to us so we can relate. So with, with, uh, Brian Koenig, um, coming up with the rocket and then having these wild ideas about, uh, nuclear, like a nuclear device, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I kind of put it akin to uh, those references back in the earlier Penny Dreadful seasons where they referenced what happened in the underground during the Victorian era, you know, just like realistic touch points. Uh, yeah, so, no, yeah. I really appreciated that. Uh, but I, I found uh, – I know I'm a sucker for for um, alliances with the bad guys and their mm-hmm. actual, you know, real badasses, you know. So, Benny Berman is one of my favourites because mm-hmm. – uh, I can't, you kind of feel like safe, an uneasy safe, safety with him because you know he's, yeah. he's going to get you back. Uh, and, and it was a terrific deal that he and Michener had. Uh, it was almost like making a deal with the devil when he says mm-hmm. something like, you realize we're friends for life now. And that's mm-hmm. basically, and that was such a, a big moment, I think, for the character, for, for Lewis as well. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I really like Tony Burman this season as well. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, I think the great thing about Brian Koenig's journey is just it's the flip around who he feels protected by and mm-hmm. safe uh, in the sense that he kind of intuitively knows that her goss um, and his Gestapo um, sidekick, Kurt, uh, really probably isn't a good idea, but he, he, he's kind of doesn't have an awful lot of choice in it. Um, and he, he, he's kind of being showered with praise and the, you know, the possibility of future prizes, but ultimately, you know, he feels safe with Dotty, um, and, and with Michener and just that that gets reversed. And I suppose it's that question that, that John Logan, um, I, I suppose asks here, uh, you know, if you, had the chance to possibly prevent the atom bomb, <laughs> then what would you do? Exactly. Um, would you take, it's kind of like, what would you do if you could go back in time and kill Hitler? Mm-hmm. You know, would you go and do it? it? It's kind of that sort of thing here. Um, just because of the influence that obviously, uh, nuclear weapons have, have had, um, 
within World War Two and through the Cold War. So I thought that was just kind of quite nice. You know, it's what would you do? Um, and I think the scene in that final episode is like so great mm -hmm. uh, with Michener yeah. and feeling that weight of what he's about to do. With um, uh, given that he's been protecting this kid uh, for pretty much the, the previous nine episodes of this series. So, uh, yeah, I, I really like that. And, of course, who didn't like, well, at least for me anyway, who didn't like Dottie? Uh, I mm -hmm. think Dottie Minter is the kick-ass granny that we kind of always want, really. Absolutely. She was doing riots in Chicago. She was running guns to Cuba, <laughs> um, you know, Gosh, we live in crap times, don't we? <laughs> I, I would love to, to you know, I don't want to do, know someone like that. I don't want to do either of those two things. I'd like to talk to someone that does this thing. Oh, yeah, no, I wouldn't <laughs> like to do them. But, you know, you kind of, there's this experience of Dottie Minter that's kind of, you know, she she's the person that would surprise you. You'd be mm -hmm. sat with this relatively elderly lady and next thing you know, she, you know, yeah. She's a kick-ass. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, let's talk about the supernatural side, the bit that binds kind of the rest of the series is kind of the supernatural side, John. Do you want to take us on with the with the discussion of Magda, really? Yeah. Meanwhile, throughout the City of Angels, Demon Magda creates various personas to influence susceptible men to ready the path for her arrival when nation battles nation, race devours race, and brother kills brother. Not a soul will be left, and Magda will appear. Her first persona, Alex, takes the form of a mousy personal assistant to closeted gay councilman Charlton Townsend. Working with German architect Herr Richard Goss, Alex encourages Townsend to get support for a road through immigrant populations in Los Angeles by promising him greater power in the city. They keep the councilman in check by arranging a relationship with Kurt, a handsome but dangerous Gestapo officer. <laughs> That sounds like Showtime wrote that, didn't it? They didn't. <laughs> they didn't. The handsome but dangerous Gestapo officer on the wrong side of the law. We've been, John's been reading way too many summaries throughout our 500 and so episodes, so now he literally could become a copy editor for, uh, for Yeah, well, he was a handsome but dangerous right, yeah. uh, Gestapo officer. Yeah. He was a surfer. He was, he was a, a surfer dude. Uh, but, but an evil surfer dude. Place. I thought they were supposed to be more chilled <laughs> and relaxed than that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> no, no. See, these are the secret surfers. These are the secret surfers that are evil. <laughs> Basically, I'm pretty sure there's yeah. a movie like uh, that. That would be awesome. I'm sure there is. Sure it's, there in is. The, <laughs> it's in the same way that the Americans trained dolphins to put mines on sort of Russian ships. Uh, the, the Nazis created uh, <laughs> Nazis a, a, a squadron <laughs> of dolphins versus of Nazi surfers. surfers. Oh my god! I, I think actually, I, I think we've got a script here, Chris. Thank I you, think right. we need to go. I yeah. Think you yeah, yeah, we need to write. We have to travel back in time to the fifties to make it there. Um, but one of the things I think we were all talking about throughout the season was, yeah, okay, Kurt's you know a member of the Nazi Party. He moved to Germany. He got his training in the Nazi Party, and then he comes back, and he's clearly falling in love with Townsend at points in this series. And we're all waiting for the other shoe to drop. It's like you do realize that you are going to be killed for. <laughs> being gay curse why are you supporting this regime just is it just because you're white mm -hmm. and you hate anybody that's non-white do you not realize that they also hate people like you you know is even you know there's a moment where tenzin brings him into the underground club and shows him what nightlife can be like for gay people in uh, in la at the time and he seems really impressed by it and you're kind of going this exact club right here everybody here will be murdered by nazis and you're helping them out when will the other shoe drop so uh, so i think there's an interesting storyline for him as well if we get into a season two for... I, I just was shocked that they decided to go with a potentially bisexual Gestapo agent. Well, there was a lot of it about, actually, in uh, Oh, I know, but they were, didn't they, you were known um, as, they were known as uh, deplorables. No, um, it was deplorables. Yes. And they were, they were subhuman less than mm -hmm. because of their sexual orientation. I just think it's... Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It was an interesting choice. It makes great sense yeah. for the story. I can see. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Just, it, it just. It's essentially you could have just quite as easily just had it as a female Gestapo agent with uh, Townshead being a cis straight white man. Uh, but this is actually a better story, and I think, as you said, it'll yeah. be interesting yeah. to see where it goes in season two. 
if we get a season two, always with the if, uh, caveat, because they can explore that, which is, I'm a racist, I'm a Nazi, I'm Gestapo, I'm gay. These two sides of me don't equate to the same thing. Absolutely. You think they think he thinks yes. he's going to be safe basically because of the support that he's given. But you know, mm. you learned throughout the, throughout the war, you learned that lots of people that supported them over time were picked off as people that weren't desirables of what the Nazi dream was effectively. So uh, a good choice for that character. Yeah. I mean, I think this is another great point of complexity with, with a character, mm-hmm. you know, Townsend again, abhorrent, uh, yet. His dad is probably even worse, and you have that great moment where you realize he's got uh, daddy issues. And then also that he is in the same kind of fairly misogynistic, um, and he's he's racist, yet he's also gay. And mm-hmm. it's this idea that this, this spectrum that is being portrayed here uh, by uh, the character of Charlton Townsend has so many contradictions in it, um, potentially to, for, for some people. Um, and he's also aligning himself with, um, you know, her goss uh here and and the nazis in order to gain power i mean you know it is spelt out really explicitly to him that when they march down uh you know the broad avenues in la that you do you want to be crushed under that jackboot or or be with the the conquerors i suppose Mm so like it's it's a really uh amazing mix of different directions for the for this just single character Uh, and all the time having alex uh, whispering in in his ear that sort of political advisor and of course like you know alex does have this moment where she offers michener um actually sort of a different alternative and I, i suppose this is the one thing i for me just to raise here is you know i think ultimately magda in some respects she's the me she's neutral in terms of the means to her end yeah. she doesn't care who she aligns with and she's willing to help out anyone as long as it brings about chaos and conflict mm-hmm. and that's why you have rio on one side you have um elsa uh, and alex on another but alex has this other little element where she offers something to mission and i'll how that plays out we don't know it's yeah. certainly not explored in this season uh, it could be something for season 2 so it's again it's just that nice little touch i think absolutely absolutely lots more personas of magda as well in the show john can kick off for sure the second rio is a co-leader of a flamboyant mexican american group the pachucos she influences tiago's younger brother mateo vega to murder the racist abuser officer riley igniting tensions between the mexican american residents and the lapd when Tiago finds out it was his brother who murdered the officer, he pins it and the murder of the Hazlitt family on another member of the Pachucos, Patsy Diego Lopez. Diego believes he has the powerful hold over Tiago, but on his transfer to San Quentin State Prison, Louis Michener is unable to protect the boy from the violent, bigoted cops who bind Louis and lynch Diego on the streets of his hometown. Oof, yeah, probably the most affecting scene in the whole series, really, for me. I think that was a really difficult scene to watch and seeing it compared, I suppose, while the Vega family were coming together, having that dance sequence all together in the Crimson Cat, while this terrible lynching is going on was really tough to watch. A third persona German immigrant, Elsa, is trying to influence another German immigrant, Dr. Peter Kraft to embrace his family's legacy as warmongers to lead his German-American Bunt organization into an influential Nazi-supporting lobby group. To achieve this goal, she creates a fourth manifestation, Frank, who creates a rift between the Kraft family and their beloved housekeeper, Tiago's mother, Maria Vega. Finally, Magda also takes advantage of a standoff between the LAPD and the Workers' Union, led by Tiago's brother, Raul Vega, to whisper in the ears of both sides to turn the confrontation violent. Raul is left with a life-threatening injury until his mother, Maria, calls on the power of Santa Murta to save him. Raul is forever changed by his brush with death, but believes he has a purpose yet to be fulfilled. As Tiago mourns the loss of Sister Molly, Magda pays a silent visit to him. 
The ground is now prepared for her arrival, and Tiago will have a part to play. Ba 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 ba. Dun dun dun. Yeah. <laughs> Just the way you finish that up, and yes, they will have a good. part to play. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yeah, he is getting much better at the, <laughs> at the synopsis for the, for the show, definitely. Um, Raul, I think we could just call him out here. Uh, a really good actor um, playing the role uh, from the first couple of episodes. We got a lot of the character and then he just dropped out of the show only to come back in episode nine and go, I know I have a purpose yet to be fulfilled. And then he dropped out of the show again uh, for the last episode. And you're going, okay, I, I, like, I get that you have some promise, something that you haven't fulfilled, but put it in the show, put a little bit of it in the show, show that he is zombie mm. uh, connected to uh, Santa Muerta or something. Show a little bit of Say it. Say it again. What they... is he? He is? Zombie yeah. bro. <laughs> he is zombie. That's the only thing I can think of that they're doing with this character. They're setting him up almost like the monster from uh, the or- original first season. Of the- mm-hmm. He is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought he was the direct just representation of they repeated that phrase of uh, um, race versus race, you know, and brother versus brother, cu- brother kills brother. So we got in the very first episode, I think it was first or second episode when um, when Tiago goes up against Raul. I thought that was just a direct thing. And it was a shame because he's such a good actor. Uh, but yeah, he was yeah. he was zombified, as you say, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I think they'll they'll turn him into he'll find in the next season if they get if yeah. you get it that he'll get shot in the yeah. arm and it doesn't heal or he like he'll his head will be decapitated he'll fall back on he'll put it on just like he'll he'll full on <laughs> zombie out over time. That would be really cool. Yeah, the, I think killable because zombies are an important part of the kind of culture of that area. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I think that could be really, really good. It really I, could be, but I, I hope the rest of the second season isn't just you know one scene of that where he doesn't die from something, and the rest of the time he sits listening to baseball. On the radio. Oh no! But can you imagine that's, that's him kind of decomposing? Of so you could well, you that's... could actually <laughs> that, which is they bring him out for the big stuff because he's slowly decomposing. Right. He's just he doesn't have the energy. He's lethargic because he has no blood pumping around him and like he, you could literally just have a scene where he's like parts of his flesh is slowly just peeling um it could he be would be reason. like peter griffin he would just sort of get meshed into the sofa yeah. where he kind of stands up and he <laughs> well he's got a sofa on his back yeah <laughs> exactly i'm going to be a little controversial here though because I, I agree he was underutilized okay but i think actually for me the greater crime of a character underutilized in this was actually Mateo. Okay. Um, and I, it's not to say that he didn't have big parts to play. He mm-hmm. did. But I think that was the point. He had this huge thing with Officer Riley that he did and the whole confrontation with Tiago and so on. And even with the death of Fly Rico, uh, in the final episode. And of course, then he, he was just sent to the sort of oil fields where all the Derricks are. Um, sort of hey, hiding yeah, out say, and Derek's out there hiding. <laughs> My God. Yeah. J- just it's an hiding army out. of Derek's <laughs> and, and we were kind of reintroduced to him where he was kind of umming and ahhing about whether it was, you know, go back to the family or mm-hmm. uh, or stay with Rio and Fly Rico. And I just felt he- at the moments when he needed more of a spotlight on him, yeah. he dropped. And I think that for me was potentially the bigger crime than leaving Raul just to kind of be under the radar mm. uh, across the whole season. Um, that, that to me, I like, I ju- it just kind of lost him. Right. Um, and I thought that was a real shame because I really liked his performance. I loved his, you know, his struggle between his family, uh, and, and the Pachucos. Mm-hmm. I love the struggle between him and Tiago. Um, you know, that scene, where effectively he's getting measured up by Rio for his Pachuco suit. Well, you know, who doesn't like a, a naked sort of, uh, sort of measuring up session? <laughs> uh, and then like, uh, just the, the death of, uh, of, of Officer Riley, um, like mm. huge and, and one of the most disturbing kind of scenes, I think, and, and bloody, um, in the show. And then it just felt like he dropped into, you know, this, this shack yeah. hiding from the cops. And I get that that would do, but I, I kind of felt I wanted more then. So yeah. Yeah. just, that's just kind of my view on it yeah. a bit, really. I, I think we already mentioned like the, the final episode does have a, a massive moment mm. as well for, for the whole Pachuco team. And then for it just to be kind of 
dropped again in that episode, but at least it's there. I think, again, overall, it kind of gets more lost in all of the stories that are being told throughout the season rather than there not being enough of, of Matteo. I think it's there is enough, maybe just it's layered in throughout a much bigger story with so many other characters that it feels like there isn't enough, maybe. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see. I, I, I think as well there was something about the... Um, just the Rio talking about the kings of the Aztecs, the blood of yeah. the Aztecs and all that kind of stuff. I felt this is where this supernatural element could have really come in. And there was something about Mateo's eyes and stuff when he was killing mm-hmm. Riley, where it felt like in seasons one to three, when you came across the demon and their eyes were black, that wasn't the case. Yeah. But I just felt that that's where you could have had this supernatural element coming from the superstitions mm-hmm. and folklore around the 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 culture of the Aztecs yeah. that Rio was really highly referencing uh, mm-hmm. in, in these moments. I thought that could have been really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the kind of general overview of the series. I know that there's a couple of things that we didn't didn't put in because it didn't fit into the main narrative of the series. Anything? Any big moments that we haven't talked about, or any big moments you want to call out, Ray? First. Oh, look, just, just in general, I think Magda, uh, I was thinking about this, uh, the other day, actually, and, and Chris, you, you pointed it out a bit early on in the episode about her role and her influencing and this thing about craft and, and her role as, as Elsa in that. Um, I think what John Logan's done, and again, it's not all black and white, but if you look at all the iterations of Magda, uh, so number one, uh, Alex, uh, she has more of a political sway. You know, over events and uh, an influence uh, with the politics. Uh, I think with Rio, it's more of a social thing. Uh, so she's really pushing uh, the Pachucos. Uh, she's really trying to incite some sort of chaos there. Uh, and for Kraft, though, it's a lot more mm-hmm. s- smaller scale. For me, it's more domestic. Um, so sh- what she does initially is yeah. basically just break up that relationship. And it may seem like a little thing, yeah. and Kraft starts to build up. Uh, her influence over him starts to build up over something else, which is bigger and grander. But I think essentially um, that was to show her, her domestic influence and like how she can influence yeah. just like man in that sense. And then you have Magda at the very beginning, at the very outset, and she kickstarts everything. Like she she literally whispers in those those officers' ears and Raoul's ears as well. Uh, so she she has more of it that direct supernatural influence. Uh, but exactly as you say, yeah. John, uh, I, I think. The influence is very subtle, and uh, maybe there could have been more supernatural uh, injection into it by visually showing something, having a bit more, a few more visual cues. Uh, but she was certainly there. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll jump in my, with mine very quickly. Um, we talked mm-hmm. about supernatural and a lack thereof, or or a less than or that we would have wanted. We're forgetting potentially the creepiest aspect of this <laughs> show: a little boy named Frank. Um, uh-huh. yeah. the molding of Frank, the, the one scene, well, there's actually two scenes that are creepy. One, uh, which is, uh, essentially Frank when we first meet him, um, in Dr. Croft's office and mm-hmm. Elsa and Frank are in the elevator and they just meld together. And you're yeah. like, what the, yeah. Yeah. what? And the biological term. Yeah. It's just like, holy <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, and Frank was a standout character, uh, the, he, yeah, the level of creepiness and the scene with Mama Vega, um, or the, that collection of scenes with Mama Vega in the house and just the culmination of him just looking at her, putting his hand over the fire and just putting it down and staring at her and then crying. Just creepy as hell. Um, oh, yeah. that was an amazing scene, actually, the way he portrayed yeah. that screaming with his hand on the burner yep. looking at v- M- M- mama vega and then Kraft and elsa come in and the change to like this yeah. quivering it's, sort of her child was just like, like oh my yeah. goodness he did that so well yeah. i thought that was amazing yep. yeah well, the second creepiest yeah. scene in this whole uh season uh was uh the knocking boots on a grave um, mm-hmm. just, we, we, you just, yeah, it's just creepy. Not gonna lie. There's, yeah. I'm not gonna get into it. It's just creepy. <laughs> it yeah. was. I must say that did just kind of transport me to, uh, the, the fairy tales of Brothers Grimm. Like, mm. thing, so just the way it was framed with the, Definitely. twisted trees yeah. uh the moonlight the kind of slight bit of fog or whatever mm-hmm. and the two of them kind of 
having a good old uh, sort of shufty yeah. on the on the grave uh, of uh, this this dead fella. I was just like, oh my goodness. Um, I know, but it's a weird conversation, really, <laughs> wasn't it? It's like, you know, oh, oh, your husband died after he attacked you. Oh, oh, you murdered him. Oh, well, I'll come over and I'll help you take care of the body. We'll bury the body and then let's have sex on top of the grave. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, do you not think you've kind of lost it at that point somehow? Probably. So yeah. I'm going to need to kill well, someone and then I can speak from empirical evidence. Oh, but I Jesus just Christ. don't no, think so. No, I don't. I, I'm yeah. just like, yeah. Okay, look, everyone's everyone's allowed their own kink. That yeah, I'm not I, I, shaming. I, if you want to, that if is... you want to have a coitus on the fresh grave, go for it. Just please don't do it at night with a demon. Okay. Everyone's allowed to have their kink, but I do think that one is illegal. Okay, uh, true, true. That is actually, <laughs> you know, yes. She did murder her husband or her pretend husband uh, and then knowingly helped the, help bury the body and then have sex. You know, I think that was illegal, illegal. But I think the kink that would be illegal was if that scene was a three way. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Has to take it further, doesn't he? Moving do you have forward. any points from the series that we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk um, about? I've got three, of course, of course uh, and I will run through these really quickly. Okay. Um, uh, I think one of them is, is, is the same uh, as Ray's, actually. It is. Um, it's that interrogation, that interview scene in, at the LAPD mm-hmm. between Tiago, Diego, and Michener. I just think uh, Nathan Lane here is quite simply fantastic, and how he, you know, is both really angry at Tiago, and yet due to his own kind of extracurricular fighting Nazis, you know, he he realizes that, um as well in some ways he needs to protect his partner and i think diego here um is just it's just really well he thinks he's got the upper hand and then this grizzled experienced detective basic basically lays it on the truth in the most brutal fashion because it's just simply it is a weighted system and this is how it will work and um, it, it's the idea of being trapped and you see that change in Diego and you see um, with the truth coming out about Tiago knowing it's his brother Mateo who killed Riley and so on and it all gets wrapped up into this bow uh, where uh, it also brings in the Hazlitt case um, and I, I just think Michener's delivery here is fantastic both yeah. in and outside and I think the whole build up of that scene across the episode um, is is really really good and I think for me it links into the other part which is the whole Crimson Cat Vega uh, dance which then mm-hmm. gets cut with Diego being lynched it's yeah. like that is so powerful uh, how that built mm-hmm. um, with this huge amount of happiness around the Vega family kind of coming back together having this massive bust up as only families can, but ultimately working through it with the tragedy that's unfolding then with Diego and, and with the, the, the crux of the LAPD. Yeah. And then again, Michener being unable to do anything about it. So they're two absolutely my favorite big moments. Uh, and the other are with Maria Vega um, and, and with Santa Murta. I loved her grotto. I loved oh, her yeah. in yeah. there with Santa Muerta. Um, you know, Maria Vega was just awesome. And again, I think she could have been used a bit like Mr. Lyle in, in season, uh, in, in the original Penny Dreadful mm-hmm. to bring out about this, um, sort of Mexican superstition, this Aztec superstition a, a bit more because she was, she had that Santa Muerta aspect. Um, I loved her having the coyote moniker as yeah. well. And I love her with Michener together when he's round at the Vega family house in the grotto. Uh, and Michener does play up the laughs in that. But it, it's just th- those scenes for me, there was something really special mm-hmm. uh, about that, as, as well as the hospital one as well. Yeah. And it, I thought they were really good. Maria and Santa Muerta, fantastic Definitely. um i thought they were great together can i just um just uh, alongside john's great points because that was one of my points as well so i just want to add apart from what john was mentioning about the uh, that interrogation scene it was very cool uh the performances the way it was written uh but for me it was a big moment because uh, it was like a game of checkers you know uh one two yeah. three yeah. and three big moves he kind of tied everything up as you say john in a bow it was, i think it was it was a masterstroke um you know so he kind yeah. of he gets Mateo off, 
Um, so he saves Tiago. Um, he gives the Hazlitt case. He, he closes that up. So that's number two. And in that, mm-hmm. in that one move as well, he actually, uh, he kind of almost saves Diego in the sense that it's like, you know, if you confess now, um, the police, the cops aren't going to beat you to death. You're going to be king in yeah. the jail. Uh, so he, he wrapped everything. It was a perfect, it was a great, brilliant move. Yeah. That's why, that's yeah. why I yeah. liked it. Absolutely. Beautiful. Like wonderful performance from Lewis. And, and again, I love how John Logan has captured something that uh, is right in the zeitgeist right now about police using their abilities and their power um, to influence everything that's going on around them because they have that yeah. power. I think that's it's really interesting that it's called out there. Uh, my, you've already kind of mentioned uh, what my main point for the season is, but I just thought it was interesting when looking back at the entire season my favorite character of the show, we didn't really even mention her in the recap of the whole season. My favorite character of the show is Mama Maria Vega. Yeah. I think every scene that Ariana Barraza is in, she owns it. And I think just the simple fact of her being the matriarch of the Vega family, where everybody's looking at her going, you're just a cleaner. But she's so much more than that to everybody around her, everybody that, that looks to her for protection, everybody that looks to her for her respect and all of the interactions she has with all the characters throughout the season. I love that moment in the, in her grotto to Santa Morita. I love, you know, I love the fact that she is so active in connecting with the supernatural. She literally kind of picks up her supernatural phone and calls down a deity <laughs> yeah. to talk to her. You know, that's a massive ability to have. And I think. When you look at it and think what this could be in season two, when we see what's going to happen between these battling forces, you know, I think it comes down to her speech in episode seven, where she talks to them and saying that her family aren't pawns, they're kings and queens, the blood of the Aztecs run through them, the soldiers of the revolution will walk beside us, you know, all of these things where she says she's going to fight Magda to the end on the side of her family to save the world. All of that stuff is really powerful. And it's, it's something that I'm really want to see more of because the actress is magnificent throughout the season. I love how sassy she is with her kids. Yeah. I love how how violently angry she gets about all the choices they're making, and then she kind of goes, "Yeah, I suppose okay. I take I take the point that you're all making yeah. your own decisions, and that's how I brought you up, kind of thing." So, but she is also so protective of the craft kids, which I think is really important for their storyline. There was a, a really nice moment where she had just been at the crafts and she'd been doing all their cleaning, all that stuff, and she comes back to cook. <laughs> The, oh, yeah. the the food and there's no one there and she's doing all these lovely kind of empanadas and what have you and I did in in my head I was I had um Kate Bush's this woman's work kind of thing going mm-hmm. around in my head because I, I felt it was just really poignant for you know it wasn't about supernatural it was this kind of humdrum of her being a cleaner yeah. coming back and then doing the household stuff and kind of her family not really uh helping out at all yeah. uh, and i thought that was really uh quite a cool little sequence as yeah. well chris i know you're getting out of here and you're going to join us for our feedback section later on any last points on the season of penny dreadful city of angels before you go no I, i'm just really excited um i i as i said i know I became more tepid on my look back on it. That mm-hmm. shouldn't take away from any of our listeners' enjoyment with this. It's mm-hmm. um, essentially, I just want to know. Um, I know that uh, originally a lot of production in the LA was st- started, was due to start back in the mm-hmm. um, first week in August in LA. Yeah. Um, uh, LA has gone back into lockdown. Um, mm-hmm. And some of this was filmed on set, uh, on site in uh, the city of Angels. So I mm-hmm. do believe potentially the the even the announcement for season two may be pushed back based on this, Maybe especially the way that the old Rona is treating us all. Um, <laughs> so I I think I'm going to set my expectations quite low in terms of when mm-hmm. we'll get an announcement. I'm going to be happy when we do. I think yeah. we are all on the same page that. While this show had some faults, um, I think it was just overall a fantastic 10 at 10 hours to spend in the city in this time period in, once again, John Logan's, to a degree, crazy mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's it for our discussion, really, on season one of uh, of Penny Gentle City of Angels. Ray, thank you so much for joining us for our discussion about this episode, and I hope you enjoyed the season overall. Oh, it's always a pleasure, guys. Uh, I love talking to you guys about it. Uh, it. You know, who better than to talk about it, talk about it with TV podcast industry? So, no, thank you very much. And mm-hmm. yeah, I'll be watching if ever there's a season two and onwards. Excellent, excellent. We will take a quick break, and we'll be back with our feedback part of the episode and 
the winner of our pub quiz. We've already recorded it, so myself, John, and Chris all know the actual winner, but uh, but Ray doesn't. So Ray, you'll have to listen to the episode to know. <laughs> <Da-da-da-da>. <laughs> I know. All right, we will be back in a moment. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. No worries. Cheers. Yeah, thanks so much, Ray. This is Cheo Hodari Coker, the creator, showrunner, and executive producer of Marvel's Luke Cage. You're listening to TV Podcast Industries, formerly known as the Defenders TV Podcast. And we're back. It's just me, John, and Chris here for our feedback section and the final answers to our Penny Dreadful pub quiz. And we announced the winner of the awesome Penny Dreadful goodies. Looking forward to that. Yes. But first up, we have some feedback in from the wonderful Steve Brown. Hey guys, this is Steve. This is for the series finale of Penny Dreadful. And I uh, have to admit, not quite as dramatic or, or maybe anticlimactic, maybe more anticlimactic than I expected it to be. Of course, you know, some, some significant things happened and we had some significant interactions. But uh, yeah, I was a little underwhelmed, I want to say. Uh, but the few standout performances, obviously... Uh, Nathan Lane just seeing the anguish on uh, his face as Michener having to to kill the kid was just uh, heartbreaking and he played it so well you could tell that it was not something he wanted to do um, loved the little moment of recognition between uh, Rio and Elsa the moment before uh, Frank uh, screams in the car and, and starts everything but it, it was a little bit Again, and maybe this is something they're going to pick up on next season, but there are really no wide-ranging consequences for that Pachuco uprising there in, in uh, after the car accident and, and all that stuff. And, and uh, there really we didn't see much of that. And, of course, we don't see much of, of Mateo after he says, you know, goodbye, brother. So uh, the interaction between uh, Diego and Magda interesting i wonder what's what's going on there uh i'm interested to see if maybe sister molly is going to become the new santa Muerta or is she going to be a uh, another figure next season I, I hope we get a next season because there's really a lot of things for them to uh, to wrap up and of course we see um oh i can't remember uh, Rory Kinnear's character's name, the doctor, Dr. Kraft, we see him putting on the medal and, and adopting the, the Hal Hitler salute. So, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff, uh, I guess for next season, I hope it gets confirmed. Anyway, um, can't wait to hear you guys thought I have not listened to your series finale coverage yet. So I need to listen to that so I can send in my answer to the question. Hopefully I'll get it in in time. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks so much, Steve. And I can confirm Steve did actually get his, uh, his answer in for the final question for the pub quiz, which will be coming up in a mo. Um, yeah, I and that's you... the end of that feedback. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, loads of great feedback there from Steve. Yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, comments on the fact that this really does set up a second season. And if it doesn't get a second season, how disappointed that would be. I think we said that on our finale podcast. But there is some great stuff in the episode, as you mentioned, with uh, with Lewis Mitchell, particularly. I think his moments with, uh, with Brian Koenig where, uh, where he has to kill him to prevent a much worse face for everybody, effectively, I think is a, a great moment in the show overall. Uh, as to whether Sister Sister Molly will come back in the second season as a uh, as a deity. I'm, not, I'm still not too sure whether that was just how the how the scene was written or whether that was intentional to set her up as some kind of deity in the future. What do you guys think? I'm fifty fifty on it. Mm. I, I think if anything, she could become the third sister, mm. the connection to humanity. Or, but it's also, as you said, it's just a, probably a very good narrative mm-hmm. because based on her story about the sister and the bunk beds, mm-hmm. um, bunk beds, uh, they, they, they're similar to bunk beds, but they were the German for the bunt. Uh, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The bunt beds. <laughs> I'm saving my misstep. Um, no. So, uh, I really don't know about the whole deity piece mm-hmm. and what Steve was saying in terms of feeling whelmed or just, Kind of just the the opposite of overwhelmed, so not over I mean, underwhelmed. or underwhelmed. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's just whelmed. Yeah. I yeah, I can see where he's coming from. I do think there's gonna be. We did see the beginning of the fallout mm-hmm. from the Pachuco riot from that one day, yeah. which is the the cops starting to close off uh, the hometown. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that very last scene. Uh, this isn't America. 
Exactly. Or Australia just say, this is America. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's where it comes to. Yeah. It, when we get season two, if we get season two, mm-hmm. a lot of that should be addressed, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I think, yeah, I, I'm with you in the sense of um, feeling a little underwhelmed um, from from the final episode, but um, I still enjoyed it, and I think I, I still scored it pretty pretty well. I mean, I was definitely a fan of it, but I I think it I, I think it all came down to um, you know setting up for for season two, and to be honest, it was reminiscent of season one of Penny Dreadful mm-hmm. and its final episode, where okay, there was this kind of battle in in the the Grand Guignol Theatre, um, but otherwise it was it wasn't sort of as climactic as as some of the other episodes. But I think that's kind of um the way really yeah. in, in a lot of stuff and certainly if you continue it through to a season two so i mean yeah it does hinge a bit on um there being a season two but uh, i i did like the episode i thought the massive battle with the Pachucos and with the sailors and what happened with fly rico was really good and mm-hmm. and even the events leading to to molly uh, committing suicide in the baptismal swimming pool um i thought was uh you know i thought was really good and and with brian as you say i think all those points were massively um significant yeah. i suppose it yeah it hinges on on this season two element i i think to be honest yeah. um but I, I i did like the episode but yeah i, I would say i was whelmed i was i was happy enough with it i wasn't <laughs> over or underwhelmed <laughs> Um, so satisfied, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm there as well. Yeah, just I think that that is, and we we pro- we've discussed it earlier when we were wrapping up kind of each of our thoughts about this. Mm-hmm. But I think that's kind of the best way to kind of where I am on this. It's I I think we've talked about it in like some of the Netflix Marvel shows in that. I will feel better about it, dependent on what happens in season two. Yeah, so absolutely. like I think that's kind of like uh, it's. Even to say the craft storyline, that is probably the best analogy. For the whole season, I was like, mm, I have no idea where this is going. Yeah. I have no idea. And then by the end, I was like, well done. Yeah. 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 You took me on a journey. I didn't know where I was going. And I'm yeah. glad we went there. Absolutely. I think that's going to be the same with season two. Definitely. And there's one narrative choice that I think was a bit odd in the final episode. Uh, you mentioned it there, Steve, in, in your feedback as well. Uh, Mateo becoming the leader of the Pachucos, like uh, Steve, I I know you mentioned we didn't see him again. You're right. We didn't see him again at all in regards to the Pachucos, but we did see him go back with the Vegas to this day of the dead celebration in the, in the grave and have all the family together. That's a narrative choice because the series is supposed to be about the family, but it does seem really weird considering what has just, what has just transpired in the city that he would come back to his family for that little moment at the end of the episode. It makes, you know, it, it, again, it's something that you want to see on screen. You want to see this whole family together because you want to see that nothing can break them apart. That's one of the central things that's happened throughout the season, but it did seem a bit odd that we didn't get some kind of aftermath to the fact that he murdered Fly Rico or that he was taking responsibility for the death of Fly Rico after Rio murdered him uh, and left his brother to die in the streets effectively. And then he comes back and sees him at the end of the episode. You know, it do- it does feel like there's no fallout to that in this season, but we'll see it next season. Yeah, so yeah. they wanted to just have that moment to say, no matter what happens between this family, they will all come back together for these big things. Like people coming back together for Christmas or for uh, Thanksgiving in America, I suppose, uh, you know, they'll all come back together, even if there's loads of tensions between them, <laughs> they still have to get together for these moments. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, as I said in the, um, in, in the, the main part of the podcast, I, I do feel that Matteo was probably the most underutilized, uh, given the significance of his storyline. Mm. Um, I know. So, I mean, I definitely think that. And I also think that again, similar to maybe season one of, the original Penny Dreadful. Actually, this is only showing a very small snippet uh-huh. of a grander scheme, um, I think, yeah. uh, in the same way that season one uh, originally did. Um, I, I, it, it's a snapshot, and it's a very focused snapshot, even though it's it's broad within its setting. Yeah. Um, and the, it, the, 
the grander scheme is much larger than this season. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, that that is definitely uh, how, how I would view uh, this final episode um, and, dare I say, it, the whole season, yeah. really. Yeah. I, I often wonder if that's just to do with the actual writers themselves. Like John Logan obviously did the first three seasons of Penny Dreadful, but he's probably aware that uh, given the relationship he has with showtime and given the relationship he has with the fans of that show that people are willing to give him a little bit of leeway to tell his story the way he wants to and tell us a first season because he's going to get a second season but i wonder whether that's worked for him in this case you know you see it with directors like john carpenter you know absolute master of directing movies but as he went on in his career he made movies very similar to the kind of stuff that was massively popular in the 80s but it was a different audience that he was making it for by the time he came around into the 90s and into the into the noughties. I wonder whether John Logan has just pitched this as a show that will run for three seasons and not delivering a first season to a brand new audience may may not have worked for him. But, but we, we have talked about this a lot in the main part of the podcast. Thanks so much for your feedback, Steve. Thanks so much for all your feedback throughout the season. It's been really good to have you. Yeah. And congratulations on the 100th episode of your own podcast. Uh, guys, go and listen to that. It's actually a really good, uh, really good chat with, uh, Steve, Mark, and two of the guys from, uh, Comic Book Men on AMC. Thanks, yeah, Steve. absolutely. Uh, thanks, Steve, so much for, for the feedback. Really mm-hmm. great to get, uh, your thoughts, uh, in through audio yeah absolutely hopefully you'll be joining us for season two of umbrella academy when we get there i think it's time to get over to the pub quiz we've delayed it long enough john time to get to over to the crimson cat for the finale and all the actual answers of the pub quiz questions i don't know it's quite early in the morning gentlemen i don't know if i can i can go i'll go for a white wine spritzer there you go Start well soon. i still need Start the shot soon. of coffee so i'll go for a, a, a martini Express express martini or whatever they are. Bloody Mary, maybe Spr- anybody? Yeah, would, Ooh, would no, no. quite well with the no, penny no, dreadful over. theme, gentlemen. <laughs> no pepper and we'll oh, actually, I do like Bloody Mary. Oh, well done, okay. well done. Round of applause. There you go, Bloody Santa Morton for everybody. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, John. Let's run through the questions and answers for season one of Penny Dreadful's Pub Quiz. Question one on episode one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for uh, getting involved in the Crimson Cat pub quiz for Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Uh, We'll run through the episodes uh, and the answers, and then we will uh, inform you of the winner, the top three. Yes. So, episode one, question one. What was Detective Santiago Vega's LAPD badge number? It was 815. Yeah, that was on his bedside table. It it? certainly was. Mm. Uh, for question two, that book that Dr. Kraft was reading, uh, which was soon to be adapted into a film, uh, was Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell mm-hmm. uh, from 1936. Yes. Then in episode three, the question, what investigation gave Captain Vanderhoff sleepless nights when he was a detective with the LAPD? It was the Florence Moore case. Mm-hmm. It was based on the case of Marion Parker, a 12 year old who was murdered in a similar way in 1927 by her father's ex employee. This is the one that Frank conjures up uh, for uh, Tommy at the sleepover to really freak him out mm-hmm. and to really uh, crystallize in Tommy's mind that Frank was a bit of a psychopath. Yeah, I remember um, being really annoyed that you chose this as the question for episode three because I'd written out all the details about the Marion Parker case. I've been really proud of myself for finding <laughs> it. And then John John chose this as the question. I was going, well, I can't tell everybody it now. <laughs> but you brought it out in the the final few uh, podcasts yeah. that we, we covered uh, of the well, episode nine and, and ten. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, just there's a little bit of a wait, you know. <laughs> uh, question four: um, it, the drink that Linda Craft certainly likes to um, quaff quite a lot, and certainly to uh, sort of uh, subdue the pain of uh, screaming kids at her son's birthday party was a whiskey sour. Mm-hmm. Yes, she certainly did knock a few of those back. Yeah, question. Hoping, hoping to see a lot more of Piper Parabo in season two. Definitely, uh, uh, if she comes back. Yeah. She would be awesome, mm-hmm. um, and I can really see her being uh, a a, um, a problem for Kraft exactly. and for Elsa, mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, question five, the swashbuckling action movie that was advertised uh, in the scene where Tiago and Lewis were going to uh, visit the Sonora Town Honey Sophia, 
who had last seen Officer James Riley alive, it was The Adventures of Robin Hood, starring Errol Flynn. There was a huge billboard uh-huh. there as they walked towards Sophia's little kind of condo. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood. And once again in your questions, you picked out something that became massive as the show went on. There was a whole uh, subplot, really, about uh, the love of Robin Hood and the family go and see this particular film in the theatre later on in the series. Of course, the set designers all knew that. That's why they chose the poster, of course. But uh, we didn't know when we chose that. No, that millisecond of footage (laughs) episode six question six the soda that diego uh, asks for while being interrogated by lewis and tiago was a can of knee high Mm. yes Uh, never heard of that until this show i had heard of it but i have no idea what it tastes like any idea chris you've been over to america much more than we have recently uh no but i miss my assumption is by the sounds of things something like a yoohoo okay yeah yeah and what's one uh, of those <laughs> a, a he he <laughs> we could go down this rabbit hole for quite some time and you who's chocolate yeah. milk isn't it it's like yeah it's like a exactly. kid's drink but we do see brian koenig asking for it during the series and a knee high i think is like a i guess it's a oh, like a yazoo <laughs> like a yazoo exactly yes exactly for you for a uk listeners a yazoo <laughs> oh my goodness there you go. please correct us if we're wrong email us to <laughs> feedback at tv podcast industries <laughs> uh on to uh Question seven. Mm. The plays that Dottie Minter recounts from her days with her father at the Yiddish theatre included such hits as King Lear, Faust, and dozens of their own plays, all done in the Yiddish mm. language. Of course, King Lear being Shakespeare, Faust uh, being Goethe, and of course then Dottie Minter collectively uh, calls out her uh, plays that she does with her father that were done in, in Yiddish at yeah. the Yiddish theatre. So, and Really importantly, we gave three points for this answer because it's not that they just have plays uh, like King Lear and Faust, it's also that there were dozens of other plays in Yiddish and that's what caused the problem for Dottie Minter. So it was important that we had all those encaptured in the answers. The reason why I'm saying that is because this is where we started losing some uh, some people from uh, from our collective that have sent in their answers. So some people started getting missing some elements of uh, of the questions that you're asking, John. So uh, important to note. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> On to episode eight, question eight. What does Maria cook up for Trevor and Tommy as a treat as they listen to the radio? Yes, that lovely dark broadcast uh, to the to the children. Mm. Um, it was popcorn. Uh, and of course, there is that moment where we do feel that uh, Frank is going to do something slightly crazy, mm-hmm. but he doesn't. He he leaves that a little later on once uh, Elsa and Peter Craft are back in the house. He does pretend he's visiting the doctor again. Opens his mouth very wide. Yes, though, that, is yeah. true. that is true. That is true. Yes, uh, another one to mention. Yeah, um, Maria cooks a lot throughout the season, so uh, her cooking popcorn didn't stand out to some people. So we lost a few more oh, no. answers here. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, that's why it's called a quiz. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Episode 9, question 9. The game that Dottie teaches Brian Koenig to play is Mahjong. Yes, so uh, in lockdown for Dottie and Brian, yes, they're playing the game Mahjong. (laughs) Uh, So, yes, as as we've all been playing during lockdown. Absolutely. Um, The only thing I know about Mahjong is that it's always installed on your PC when you get it. It's beside Solitaire, and I've never, ever played it (laughs) because it looks really complicated. But Brian seems pretty good at it. Dottie seemed like she uh, wins every single hand, though, because she's very, very good. And finally, fellow dreaders, yes, it is question 10. The sauce that Benny Berman is cooking up at the Vega family residence and the recipe that he promises to reciprocate to Mama Maria Vega. Mm -hmm. So he is cooking up uh, Maria's mole uh, sauce, which is a traditional Mexican marinade and sauce. And Benny promises to pass on the recipe of rugula uh, to Maria, which is a uh, is actually Yiddish for twists, and it is a Jewish pastry, uh, a bit like a croissant uh, mm. that is done. Um, so yeah, Yummy. I actually when he said rugula, I thought he was talking the. I thought he was saying, "I will give you my recipe for rocket salad leaves." Oh, right. I was like going, <laughs> "Okay," because yeah. obviously. Uh, Rugla is uh, also uh, rocket. Is it interesting? Yeah, interesting. In yeah. Italian, I think. 
See, it's one of those ones when you see this on TV shows and, you know, the mole, they make it all seem really, really tasty. And you're like, I hope they release a Penny Dreadful City of Angel cookbook so we can, we can cook up uh, some of the awesome stuff, um, that, that's cooked throughout the series. The mole looked gorgeous. And the, and the rugula, you know, especially because it's kind of breakfast time here when we're recording, I'm, I would really like, uh, some, uh, some Yiddish twists. I think mole is also where they actually have chocolate in the sauce. Mm. I think they put hey, dark... what now? I want it. Yeah, it's okay. You know, it's cocoa because obviously, um, that, that would have been a, a traditional ingredient, um, of kind of the Aztecs and, and so on. Mm. Um, I, I think so. Okay. Um, I think it's got chocolate in it. But anyway, moving on to Rich and Velvety, um, we want to thank everyone for their entries yep. um, and contributing to the Penny Dreadful pub quiz. Absolutely, yeah. We have to say huge thanks to everybody that entered over the course of the 10 episode series. Um, I know it's really difficult. There's one question for every single episode. We, uh, we usually keep them towards the end of the episodes as well. So difficult to get all of your answers in throughout the season. Uh, we got a few entries for, for like five or six questions of the season, but we do have some standout people who did, uh, 10 questions and 10 answers, uh, for the season. John, do you want to count down our, uh, our top three? Yes, so our top three in uh, reverse order. On 11 points out of 13, it is Tristan Manuel. Uh, thank you, Tristan. Mm. Uh, you get the bronze medal here um, for uh, your pub quiz answers. In second place, it was Steve Brown oh, with Steve. 12 points. And the winner... The winner is on a 13 out of 13 is Brianna Vielbruder. Uh, thank you so much, uh, for that. Yes, you will be getting the Penny Dreadful Prize, mm -hmm. which will be, uh, drinking equipment, basically, <laughs> that is, uh, that is, has the Penny Dreadful motifs. Yeah. I think primarily of the Crimson Cat. So a big congratulations to Brianna for her hard work in getting a full 13 out of 13 uh, for the pub quiz. And of course, to our silver placed medalist, uh, Steve and our bronze medalist, Tristan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's always very competitive. These pub quizzes, and it's always down to the fine margins, a bit like on our 500th uh, uh, anniversary podcast for our 500th episode. And mm -hmm. um, we did a three rounds of a pub quiz there. And again, it was all very, very close. It's so that's amazing. certainly the thing I've noticed yeah. with uh, our pub quizzes so far. And Lo it seems to be the the ones that seem so simple that throw people off. It seems to be those ones. There's a few questions that were in there that I thought would be quite difficult Um and it seemed like the one that really threw everybody off was what Maria was cooking for Trevor and, and Tommy. Maybe just people don't think that she's cooking popcorn. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe because Maria is such a great cook throughout the show that there's so many other recipes that she did. The popcorn probably didn't stand out to people. But you did give them a clue that they were sitting down to, for their entertainment for the evening. So uh, entertainment for the evening always includes popcorn. So well done. Yeah. <laughs> well done to our winner, though, Brianna. Uh, I know Brianna's a massive fan of Penny Dreadful. Uh, I know she's been on Twitter and been... Uh, been listening to a bunch of other podcasts, listening to our podcast for a while as well. So uh, congratulations, Brianna. We'll be in contact with you to get your details to send out your Penny Dreadful City of Angels goodies. Yeah. Yes. We're we're so glad for everyone could join us for this pub quiz. Of course, we may be doing another pub quiz coming forward. No spoilers, mm -hmm. but we may be doing it. Will it be for Umbrella Academy? Will it be for the boys? Time will tell. <laughs> Time will tell. Exactly. Yeah, I just don't know what the prize would be for the boys. I suppose it would be like half a gram of Coke or something like that. <laughs> it's basically, it's a, it's a plaster cast of all of us giving the middle finger. <laughs> cast in bronze. <laughs> and I'm just... Just we hate soups. I was just thinking of a massive bag of blood that explodes well, exactly. on a rifle at the door. That's um, basically the boys. Exactly. <laughs> or or maybe even for Umbrella Academy, we could get a nice little flowery uh, 
telescopic umbrella. Yeah, a nice umbrella with the, with the logo on it. Be pretty cool. Hope they sell those. Actually, I'd love one of those for myself. Thank you so much for joining us throughout this season of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Hopefully, we'll see you back on the Dreadful podcast for season two of Penny Dreadful City of Angels uh, whenever it gets confirmed. Uh, if you're only subscribed to us over on the Dreadful podcast and you want to hear the rest of our stuff, come back over to TV Podcast Industries, where, as Chris mentioned, we will be covering the Umbrella Academy season two beginning on the 31st of July. Uh, really looking forward to getting into that show. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we've already put out our uh, season one recap over on Patreon, uh, and that'll be available on our main feed on TV Podcast Industries. But if you want to get that right now, pop on over to patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Support us on any level, and you'll get access to our Umbrella Academy episodes early uh, before anybody else. And we'll be back after the Umbrella Academy with The Boys Season 2. Lots of Season 2s coming up. Yes. Which I'm really enjoying because we did a whole year of mostly Season 1 of shows that we didn't know were going to be confirmed for a second <laughs> season. So it's always exciting when you get into a second season with characters that you know. So uh, really looking forward to that. Yeah, Season 2 of... Um Umbrella Academy will be on Netflix from the 31st of July, uh, and we will be releasing the episodes uh, from then. And season two uh, of The Boys begins on the 4th of September. Mm -hmm. So we will be uh, beginning our podcasts on The Boys um, from, uh, yeah, from the 4th of September. Yeah. So th there's a lot to, to come. And of course, if you are still waiting, if you are wanting to darken your days of of the bright summer then go to the the evil dark world of city of angels uh penny dreadful uh or indeed the first uh three uh series of penny dreadful mm -hmm. in the dark dank gaslit uh victorian era <laughs> if you dislike the sun like vampires then absolutely that is the place to go Yes, and as we record this, uh, we are a week ahead of Comic-Con at home, so obviously new shows may be announced, mm -hmm. uh, returning shows, may, uh, renewed shows may be announced, so as we, as and when we find out the information, we will obviously on, over on Twitter and our socials, uh, we will let people know if there's anything interesting. Mm -hmm. But at the same point, why not just follow us so you know too? You can follow us on Twitter at TV Pod Industries and you can go to facebook.com slash groups slash TV Podcast Industries to ensure that you see the latest news, usually posted by our ever loving Blue-eyed producer Derek, <laughs> you're all gonna have to do a lot more of that soon, guys. <laughs> as we go into, I can't hear the you. Rest of the stuff. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hopefully, there'll be more posts for the other guys as well. You get to see them a bit more over on socials. Um, yeah, this has been a bit of a journey. Thirty-seven episodes of our Penny Dreadful podcast. Thirty-eight episodes, actually, if you include this one. Uh, since we started in January, didn't we? With uh, with Ray when we did the first episode. Of I think so. It may have Penny even Dreadful. just been into February. So yeah. it's kind of like four seasons of a show in six months. Yeah. Ah, uh, what lockdown will allow you to do? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it did also allow us to get to our 500th episode uh, way earlier than I thought we were going to as well. So, uh, so yeah, thanks for uh, for that, Penny Dreadful. Uh, thanks for joining us, fellow Penny Faithful. Yes, thank you, Dreaders, for joining us. We really hoped you enjoyed our coverage of City of Angels and, of course, the original Penny Dreadful series. Yes, thank you so much. As always, we love seeing you. We love chatting to you. Uh, well, obviously, we can't see you, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> I am imagining each and every one of you standing before me like a crowd. Yes, my accent will get worse as we decide to go to different countries and different <laughs> shoes. Shoes? I don't know why I was doing a great British accent. Very Shakespearean, if you will. Oh, that was British. Oh, um, no. That, was, that wasn't even a yeah. low British. So <laughs> any shows no. that involve Russian accents or any other accents, uh, we will be avoiding so that mm -hmm. Chris will not pollute the airwaves. Yeah, no, no das boot for us. <laughs> uh, see you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thanks so much, fellow Dreaders. A pleasure speaking with you, as always. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and... Keep screaming. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.